Remember how random segregation of alleles was a fundamental assumption in our previous discussion of single gene transmission? A similar assumption is necessary when we start talking about two or more genes. We assume that if, in a, uh, that if a gamete ends up with one allele of a gene, it doesn't affect the other alleles from the other genes that also end up in that gamete. And we call this assumption independent assortment. And to demonstrate independent assortment, we could sit here and draw out a 4x4 four four Punnett square. And if you'd like to see that done, I encourage you to check your textbook. Or we could use the assumption that these alleles assort independently to reason out the possible genotypes and phenotypes using something called a forked line diagram. So to demonstrate, let's return to our two gene example from earlier, where we considered round versus wrinkled seeds. And so round was dominant over wrinkled. And we also considered whether the seeds were green or yellow, where green is the dominant, the dominant allele. I'm sorry, yellow is the dominant allele over green. And if we were to take hetero, uh, hybrids, right, homozygous plants of just one of these alleles, right, uh, just one of these genes, so let's just consider uh, round seeds versus wrinkled seeds, if we crossed these homozygotes, we would expect um, progeny genotypes, a quarter of them to be homozygous dominant, a half of them to be heterozygous, and a quarter of them to be homozygous recessive. Similarly, for yellow seeds versus green seeds, we also expect if we cross a hybrid, one quarter of them to be yellow homozygous dominant, one half of them to be yellow heterozygous, and one quarter of them to be green homozygous recessive. Now, because these two genes assort independently, which alleles any particular seed receives for W are independent of the alleles that it receives for G. And so we can represent these two events like this. that a little clearer. Sorry about that. Thus, our elementary outcomes, we can simply enumerate by asking what are the elementary outcomes of this set of events, and for each of those, what are the additional elementary outcomes for this event, right? 
And because these events are independent, we can, re we can, we can determine the probability of each of these elementary outcomes just by multiplying together these probabilities, right? So this one is 1 16th, 1 8th, 1 16th, 1 8th, 1 quarter, 1 8th, 1 16th, 1 8th, and 1 16th. Note, as with any good sample space, that the sum of all of these probabilities is one, right? This covers the entire space. You can also treat phenotypes this way. So we expect the phenotypes of this to be, um, sorry, we expect the, having a brain fart here, we expect the phenotypes of this to be three, this cross to be three quarters round and one quartered wrinkled, and we expect the phenotypes of this cross to be three quarters, I'll go ahead and write them up, three quarters round, one quarter wrinkled, and three quarters yellow, and one quarter green. And so similarly, again, because these events are independent, we can set up a similar tree to this. It's a little bit shorter, which is nice. Big W, big G, and little g, and little w, big G, and little g. So, um, right, round and yellow, round and green, wrinkled and yellow, wrinkled and green. These we expect to be three quarters and one quarter three quarters and one quarter, three quarters and one quarter. And because they're independent, we can simply multiply them together. So nine sixteenths, three sixteenths, three sixteenths, and one sixteenth. And if you've been staring at, um, if you've been staring at some, uh, uh, a four by four Punnett squares, you know that this nine to three to three to one ratio is the traditional phenotypic ratio outcome for a dihybrid cross. So I don't know about you. I find this way of thinking about uh, crosses and probabilities when there are multiple genes involved so much more satisfying than making a huge Punnett square. And while making a like a two, like a two gene Punnett square is tedious, trying to map out three genes or more using a Punnett square is pretty impossible. And because we're using this kind of more conceptual approach, assuming independent assortment and some of the principles of probability, it's a lot more generalizable, right? This approach is a lot more generalizable. So let's do some generalizing and let's take these ideas from plants into humans.